today we're going to look, we're in the angelic conflict. Uh, that's our series. This is our third lesson. We're going to talk about God's judgment upon Lucifer. That was his name prior to the fall or during the fall as well. And <clears throat> during the Olivet Discourse, uh, and I put the, this starts in chapter 24 and goes through 2546. The 24th and 25th chapters of Matthew is the Olivet Discourse, a very famous discourse. And Jesus tells us in Matthew 25, 41, the sentence that Satan and the fallen angels were given when they revolted in eternity past. We weren't told in those passages, like Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 26, but he, he, give, he tells us, and what is interesting, if you have a study Bible, do you have a study Bible with you? Uh, take a look uh, at verse 31, uh, 2531, look, I, not to read it, but above it, is your, do you have, um, um, like mine divides it, it says judgment. Judgment of what? Gentiles. Gen Gentiles? Mm hmm It says, mine just says judgment. Was that above, above 31? Yeah, above it. It should be, there should be some kind of a title connected to it. The, the, What's it say? Sheep, sheep and goats. goats. Sheep and goats, yeah. The judgment of sheep and goats. Yeah. <clears throat> well, what's interesting is that this, what, what, in the Olivet Discourse, <clears throat> and you can see that when you look, do you have a red lettered, you know, the led, le, red lettered yeah. part? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Well, just take a look for a minute. Look at, look at chapter 24. I mean, it's just covered up, isn't it? Yeah. The only time it's not is to tell you where it is and what, he said, what he's going to tell you, right? Mm -hmm. And look, you, you go on, and, and it's the most red-lettered thing you would ever see in your life. Yeah. I mean, he is just talking. I mean, he's really preaching, Annie. He? Teaching. Well, when we get to chapter 25 in the Olivet Discourse, uh, he deals with judgments. And it is in this context that he lays out verse 41. And it is verse 41 and the comments Christ makes that we understand that when Sa Satan revolted, there was a judgment placed upon him uh, and, and a sentence. He was sentenced. Hmm? Yeah. Now, I want to read it and then I want to tell you why that's important to you and I. Uh, I'm in verse 41. And he says, and then he will also say to those on his left, you know, that's the goats and the sheep, you know, the goats and the, what was yours? What was that? The goats and the sheep, sheep the goats and the sheep. Mm -hmm. Well, that's what you got going to right and left. Then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, accursed ones. Now watch this. Into the eternal fire, which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. Right? Now, here's what's important. We know that this revolt and this judgment and this sentence given to him was an eternity past before the foundation of the world. The secret to the foundation of the world is the world was recreated or restored in its created form, right? Genesis 21, 22, and then on to three for the human race. For the human race. When it talks about the foundation of the, for, that Christ was chosen from the foundation of the world, is talking about the period of human history, where human history began and where it ends. And that's what the Bible's discussion is all about. The Bible is all about the angelic conflict and the human race. And these judgments that are rolling down, Satan being part of that, tells us that. And so, if you understand that, then you understand why the human race was created in this situation and placed on earth. 
right? Because it's, it's totally connected to the angelic conflict. It's totally connected to it. So it, it serves us well to pay attention to what God's program is for the human race in midst of the angelic conflict and how to win. And we'll be talking about it as we further get into the angelic conflict. The angelic conflict has amazed me that it's not taught more than it is because it's a major, it's a major a doctrine. It was in the Old Testament. It wasn't. It is in the New Testament. But so um, it's just kind of interesting. You know, you always pay attention to context. Here's a verse in context. When we look at the context, he's talking about the judgment. And he's talking about the judgment that's going to roll down at the end of human history. And he talks about well, how it's going to how how Satan is going to be involved in the end of human history, and then what's going to happen to him. Uh, uh, and what, what was his sentence? In eternity past, he was sentenced. And what was he sentenced to? Lake fire. Lake fire. Uh, and, and in this passage, he refers to it as the eternal. Come on in, Mike. We're waiting on you. Haven't had prayer. Uh, just playing with you. Cat and a mouse or two cats, I'm not quite sure. Or two mice, I'm not. No, that's it. He'll help you. Just sit down, Michael. We, we can't afford to have you walk up and back. Well, what's it? Go ahead and get it for you. You got your pencil. Got your driver's license with you? Huh? We check everything in here, buddy. Uh, <laughs> let's have it. I guess I, I've, I haven't had prayer yet. Uh, I got distracted with Mike. Let's, let's have prayer. I gave you a moment of silence. Remember, the Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. Can't study it in carnality. Evidence of carnality would be personal sin. It could be mental attitude sins. It could be overt sins. It could be sins of the tongue. Your responsibility as a believer priest, according to 1 Peter 2, you're a believer priest, is to confess your sin, according to 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And uh, that's how it becomes a spiritual book in your hand for your spiritual living. And it begins with learning. All begins with learning, learning right here in classroom. Father, we thank you tonight for these that have come our way by the automobile and the Internet. And we pray the Holy Spirit would minister the truth of the word of God to us tonight about the angelic conflict and the role the human race has in it. And the final judgment for Satan, the sentence that he was given eternity past will be fulfilled at the end of human history when he will be cast into the eternal fire called the lake of fire in the book of Revelation. It's important that we not be, that we not follow him in that judgment. It's a volitional journey. We can either believe in Christ or him. We can either believe in the gospel or reject it. And I pray tonight, Father, we would understand what this is all about and we're engaged in that in many ways that we may not realize other than a study like this tonight. And I pray for that around the world, that they will have eyes to see and ears to hear and hearts to believe in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, last week we studied the fall of Satan. <coughs> This week, we're going to look at four aspects of God's judgment upon Lucifer. Remember, that's his, his uh, eternity past name, uh, his angelic name. Um, you know, God names all the stars and he names all the angels. And so we know a little bit about that. Uh, he's known to us as the devil. He's known to us as Satan. He's known to us as the evil one, which we'll talk about tonight. 
We very seldom ever refer to him as Lucifer, except in historical teachings like this. And remember that that is a, remember that Lucifer is a name that's given to him. It's personification of the, of the idea of the star of the morning. And it's Latin. Well, let me talk about the first thing. During the Olivet Discourse, which we talked about, uh, which is recorded in Matthew 24, 25, and because it's in all red, it's well worth your time sometime just to glance over that. One of the things I hope to do uh, in uh, the next year, somewhere around January, I'm, I'm going to start, um, I'm going to pick out one of the, one of the four Gospels and go back through it. And I'm toying with which one to do right now. I'm kind of torn between Luke and Matthew, and so I'm working on those uh, ideas now. I think every once in a while, also during that series, that time, I'm going to go through uh, a study of, uh, of creation again. I'll tell you why that's important. I, I don't need to tell you. I do it all the time. Uh, I think it's a key and I think it's a key because there's so much disinformation in school systems today. And they need to have a good understanding, of, the Christians need to have a good understanding of the creation story and how important it is. So I'll be doing that come the first of the year. But here we are in the Olivet Discourse, and uh, that's a, this is a great discourse, and you can see it's at the end of Matthew, so we're, we're setting at the crucifixion when he lays all this out. And, and and like I said, when you have a Bible that has red print and you look at Matthew 24, 25, it just, I mean, there's very little black print, is there? Very little. I mean, <laughs> he is really clicking it. I mean, he is really after it in the Olivet Discourse. It's called the Olivet Discourse where, where it took place. Um, and I want to show you some things. Notice I wrote the on under point one, I wrote Matthew 24, 25, 41. And I want to show you a couple Greek things that make this important. Um, it let me read it again as I wrote it on the paper. Then he notice that's a capital H, then he will also say to those on his left, Depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire, which now this is important. See that word which? That's, that's the eternal fire which, the eternal fire which has been prepared. Notice this Greek word is a perfect passive participle. What's the perfect tense? Completed in the past, the results remains completed forever. Or unless God tells you otherwise. Right? Perfect tense could, he could say somewhere in the scriptures. We saw it the other day, Remember? This will occur until Christ comes, dies on a cross, is buried and raised from the dead. That fulfills that perfect tense. But it will be in a perfect tense until another prophecy says that's how it's fulfilled. Well, here we are, which has been prepared. Um, and, that, and that's a good word for prepared. But the perfect tense tells us that this occurred in eternity past uh, because it deals with the angelic conflict. It deals with Satan's judgment and and. And it answers, well, how could he be judged to the lake of fire? What happened? What happened to cause the devil to be judged by the lake of fire? Great. So the question is, what happened? And, of course, we know that from Isaiah 14, etc. And we've studied that. We're now in the third lesson on that. And, uh, and so that takes us, th that's really important because that tells us that in that angelic economy, there was a judgment passed and a sentence. And the sentence will be fulfilled at the end of human history, Revelation 20. Now, here's something important about the lake of fire, uh, the eternal fire, or what, what uh, John in the book of Revelation calls the lake of fire. Here's what's interesting when you look at it, do a study of the lake of fire. There are three things that stand out about it. First, the lake of fire is the final abode to the false prophet and the dictator of the revived Roman Empire. That's the two guys that are the enemy of God in the tribulation, right? The false prophet and, and the dictator. Um, they were, listen, 
And according to Revelation, they'll be the first to be thrown into the lake of fire. The first. And that, that will occur at the end of the tribulation. They're, they'll be thrown. Notice what it says. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire, which burns with brim, brim, brimstone. The second thing, and that's kind of interesting, that part. The second thing that's of interest about the lake of fire is the uh, talking about who's going there is the abode of Lucifer. The devil uh, is going to be the lake of fire. Uh, and we saw that right in Matthew 25, 41. And we're going to see it executed uh, in Revelation 20, 10. And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet, that's the two guys we mentioned earlier, are also and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Right? Now, there's a third <laughs> abode that's of interest. The final abode, the final abode of the unbeliever, the one who rejects the gospel of Jesus Christ, is the lake of fire. It is stated this way in Revelation 20, 15. You remember when we're in Revelation, in that, in that 10 through 15 passage, we're in what's called the great white throne judgment. So uh, we're in these passages. We're in Revelation 20. We're in the great white throne judgment. It says, and if anyone, anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Now, whose name, whose name gets recorded in, in, the, in the book of, of life are those who have life. Not human life, but eternal life, right? Those are believers in Christ. 1 John 5, 11 through 13 says that in Christ is eternal life, and those who have Christ have eternal life. 1 John 5, 11 through 13. I just summarized it. And Paul talks about the book of life in a very interesting way in Philippians 4, 3 that tells us that the book of life are all about those who have believed in the gospel of Christ, that he died for our sins, was buried and raised from the dead third day. That's the gospel. Believe it. And it's the power of God to save you. Romans 1, 16. He says it this way. Indeed, true companions. I ask you also to help these women. He's talking to the church believers. At Philippi, I ask you also to help these women who have shared my struggle in the cause of the gospel. They were in a little uh, inner, they were a little a conflict within the church. Together with Clements also and the rest of my fellow workers of the gospel, whose names are written in the book of life. There you are. And Revelation, third chapter, verse five says, if your, if your name is written in the book of life, you can never be blotted out. And it's, it's not a book we have. It's a book he has. Like a roaring lion roams around seeking someone to who? To devour. To devour. Okay? Now we're talking about a hungry a hungry lion. So the devil, he has a lot of tricks up his sleeves. Not one that we couldn't be aware of. Not one we couldn't be aware of. If you're a spiritual person, you can see it way up front. You, listen, as a spiritual person, you can see it in other people's life, can't you? You go like, whoa, man, you're on thin ice, right? Well, we can see it in other people's life. You can see it in your own, too, if you're spiritual. If you're carnal, you can't. You can't see it in others. I mean, you, you can see when it gets really bad, but you can't see it when it's, when it's in your ballpark. That's the devil. See, all of those was referenced to the devil in the angelic conflict. The next one, and, and I didn't put them in any order. I just put them alphabetically. The next one is the evil one. I gave you the Greek word. In 1 John 3, 12, we see this evil one at work in Genesis 4, 8. Because in 1 John 3, 12, they're talking about Genesis 4, 8. And they talk about it in kind of an interesting way 
when uh, Cain kills Abel. And it tells you why he killed him. And it was strictly angelic conflict. Because Abel's works, Abel's work were righteous and his were evil. Remember that? In 1 John 5, I want you to put your eyes on 1 John. Put your eyes on 1 John 5. That's, that's at the end of the book, like Revelation, just back it up. And go 1 John, there's a 1, 2, 3. A lot of bathrooms in that house. In the fifth chapter, looking at 18, 19, here's what it says. You see, I'm bringing you New Testament passages to tell you how the angelic conflict works and how old this conflict is. See? Now, here's verse 18. We know that no one who is born of God sins, but he who was born of God keeps him, the, keeps him and the evil one does not touch him. Not harm him. There's something. What's your say? Does not. What's King James say? Does not harm him. Oh, touches him not. Well, they stayed right on par. Uh, that's what mine says. Touches him not. Does not touch him. Look, but he who is born of God keeps him, and the evil one who does, and the evil one uh, cannot touch him. In order for the devil to, put, quote, put his hands on you, he has to have permission, and he can only, he can only, and he's only gained enough based on your growth, spiritual growth. See, Paul talks about it in 1 Corinthians 10, 13. Of course, it is the story of Job, isn't it? If you, if you want to know, what, well, do you have a proof text? Yeah, Job 1 and 2. If you, you know, if you got the courage to read two whole chapters, <laughs> but there it is. I'm not going to give you the verses because you need to read it, but Job one and two. So, so that's the first thing he says. Second thing he says, we know. Did he say that in verse 18? Yeah. See that, that you ought to pay attention to that when he said it twice, don't you? you? Now you may have not known before tonight, but you what? Know now. Right? And not only do you know, but you know where, where it can be found. Okay. We know that we are of God. Well, how do you know that? Because I believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. If I'm in Christ, I'm in, I'm in God, John 10, 28. And we know that the Son of God has... No, I'm in 20. We know that we are of God and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. And why do you think he's called evil? Because that's what he's after. That's his modus operandi. Okay, he's the evil one. Now, also, uh, I, I don't, th did I put, look, look, did I put Ephesians 6.16 on your paper? Okay, you ought to write that under the evil one. You ought to write that because that's the passage that deals with put on the full armor of God. And so let's just go there because you're very familiar with that passage. Um, Ephesians 6.16 is what we're looking at. Put on the full armor of God. Uh, and in addition, we're going to, in verse 16, uh, we're, we're, we're putting on the armor. We're putting all the different pieces of the armor on. And now... We've taken on the shield of what? Faith. The shield of faith. Verse 16. In addition to all these, uh, taking uh, up the shield of faith. Of course, you, don't, you can't put it on. You take it up, don't you? The shield of faith with which, and this is why you have it. Now watch what. With which you will be able to distinguish, distinguish extinguish, all the flaming missiles of the evil one. Yeah, fiery darts. Yeah, they're talking about they're talking about the big stuff that hit in warfare, right? Listen, some of them. Wait, wait. The shield of faith extinguishes 
Some of them, right? All of them. I'm say it again. All of them. All of them. That's why you have the shield of faith. All of them. How important is faith? I mean, how important is faith, man? I mean, faith, the faith cycle, where you hear it, you believe it, you apply it, and you complete it, right? That's, that's how important this is. And completing it is when you've got the shield of faith and no matter, listen to me, this is important, no matter what he, you're going to have a lot of stuff thrown at you. No matter what he throws at you, boom, there's the faith, faith, faith does it, right? Boom. That's the only way. The shield of faith, boom, there it is. What's it do? It hits faith and faith beats it every time. It don't matter what he throws. It don't matter what he throws or how much he throws. Boom. It's not one thing. You can't leave the shield of faith at home, people. People, it, You know what I mean? And if it's in your soul, it's there for you to bring it out, right? You're, you know, as soon as the arrows start coming, if you get, you're going to put the shield up, right? Yeah, I, I tell you, they tell you when you hear it thunder, you get all the, listen, even, even the little kids of our family, like, you know, two, three, four, when they hear it thunder, them little feet, you, they get to going, boy. They head for the house like crazy. And I go like, that's good. Listen, even the dog knows to go. I mean, they could do that instinctively, don't they? Yeah, and they, they'll they hide. Yes, they will. And the little kids will be right there with them wherever they are uh, with that dog. So uh, Ephesians 6, and notice it's the evil one. The flames of the what? What's he shooting? He's, he's firing evil on us. He's firing evil in military terms. See, I'm talking about military terms, ain't I? All right, then we have Satan. That's probably the most famous title, which is the adversary. Um, and probably one of the ones I quote a great deal about because it just stuns me. And uh, I think it stuns me as a warning to myself. And so I like Matthew 16, 23, when Jesus is in this conversation with Peter about going to the cross and he's been teaching heavy on it. And he tells Peter, it's time. I'm, we got, we got, I'm ready to do this. And, you know, Peter rebukes him and Jesus says get behind me Satan you are a stumbling block to me for you are not setting your mind on God but rather on the interests of man that's a, a lot of stuff right there I mean if you dissect that like I just spoke it if you dissect that thing it gives you a real big heads up on why the shield of faith is important no matter who you're talking to and no matter how much you think they know, if they throw a, a fiery missile at you, and they do, Peter, right? Peter is one of the three close associate guys of Jesus Christ. A confidant. Paul would have called him Paul would have called him one of my true companions. And he threw a fiery dart. Up went the shield. Can never let your guard down. If, if evil strikes, throw your shield up, right? In John 13, 26 and 27, we find Judas is carried. And he's very important in the angelic conflict, Judas Iscariot, not just because he betrayed Christ, <clears throat> prophetically, the one who prophet, pro, that portrayed Christ, uh, betrayed Christ. But he is the one that we finally see in the whole angelic conflict. You know things are really tight when Satan indwells him. Not a demon. Satan himself indwells him. Now, you know this is big-time stuff. I wish this story had it ended like Mark 5. When Jesus just looks over and puts him in a pig and pushes him over a cliff. That would be a... That'd be a good story. But you know what Jesus did? Jesus told him, 
He said, listen. Go quickly and do what you've got to do. You know what he's saying? This is a sad day in my life, but you're going to fulfill the plan of God prophetically because he, it was prophetic that a close friend would betray him. Agreed? Psalms 41 9. What a sad day in your life when you have to say that to a, a person that's been with you for so long and traveled with you and been part of your ministry. And there went the shield of faith. Go do what you got to do. We got to get down with our work. How tough is that? I mean, you, you know what I'm telling you? I'm telling you, as the day approached for him to fulfill his goal and purpose in life for God, it got really heated up, didn't it? I mean, co close confidants are falling by the wayside. Now he's got somebody that Satan hasn't, listen, wouldn't give this assignment to anybody. He put this assignment on himself. Just think about that. He doesn't do that. Listen, when he, when he blew up the Andaluvian period civilization, when he blew the civilization up, he sent his top man down, a guy called Apollon, to do it. You, you understand how big a deal it is when Satan indwells him? Indwell, Judas is scared to make sure that this job got done and got done right. You got to give this to nobody else to screw it up. You know something big is up. Do you know that in your life? Do you know that? Satan can't mess with you. Right? He has to have permission. If he does mess with you, you know, you fight him with his shield. And if he does, then you go like, okay, this is God's assignment for my life. Romans 16, 20 is a verse you ought to circle because it's a promise verse to you. It says soon, because we live in the period of the soon. When you read Romans 16, 20, the soon is your period of life. This is where we live. We live in the soon. It says soon Satan will be crushed under your feet. Think about that. Soon. We live in the soon. When the rapture comes, we go to the tribulation, and then we're in countdown, aren't we? Soon. We live in the soon. Your feet will crush him. Wow. How good is that? Here's a third idea about our lesson. As a result of the fall of Lucifer, two categories of the angels evolved, fallen and holy. Sometimes they're referred to elect or chosen. The holy angels who followed Lucifer and revolted against the plan of God in eternity past became the fallen angels the ones who did not, the ones who did not follow uh, Satan, uh, remained holy angels. In First Timothy five twenty one, it, talking about the good ones, I only charge you in the presence of God, and of Jesus uh, and of Christ Jesus, and notice this three three things mentioned: the presence of God, the presence of the of Christ Jesus. And the presence of his, of his chosen or holy angels to maintain these principles without bias, doing nothing in the spirit of partiality. He's in a discussion on that. But look at, you know who he's talking to? He's talking to people like you and me. He's talking to the church. He's talking to church age people. And he says the things that we do in our life, the things we do in our life, the everyday 724s, is done in the presence of God, done in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ, done in the presence of the holy angels. Who is watching us? And why are they watching us like this? Because of the angelic conflict. Because we're fighting the war. Are we not fighting the war? 
God has put it on the church to fight the war in our dispensation. We are warriors. We fight the war. Everybody's watching us fight this war. This is a big deal. I don't know if you ever thought about that. I, I don't know if you should look over your, cor over your shoulder uh, to see if they're there. Just know they are. If you're spiritual, everything's done in their presence. And look at you got God. Where's the Holy Spirit? In, in us. You got God watching. Got the Holy Spirit doing it. You got Jesus watching. You got, and you got the chosen angels. You got the holy angels watching our operation in the angelic conflict here on earth. I mean, that's a whole lot of that's a whole lot of people. That's all. And listen, that's all our people, my people. You know, that's my people. Uh, here's one. How about this one in Luke fifteen ten in the parable? You know, we, you know we have the ten coins, the hundred sheep, the ten coins, and the two sons. You remember that parable? Listen to this. Now we've talked about this before, but listen. In the same way, I tell you. There is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Do you love that? In the presence of who? The holy angels. W what are they keeping score on? The angelic conflict. They are spectators of the arena of the warfare we're fighting. How about 1 Corinthians 4, 9? For I thank, I thank God has exhibited us apostles last of all as men condemned to death because we've become a spectacle to the world, both to angels and to men. How about that? You know what's happening? And it and it's happened out throughout church age, people being martyred for the name of Jesus Christ. You know how blessed we are in America that we haven't been martyred yet? We haven't really even been persecuted much, at least not in our period. Not for the name of Christ. We might have been for a lot of other reasons, but not for the name of Christ. And we, and you know why? Because, the, listen to me, and this is important for you to know this, and I, and I thank God that you, you're so attentive. It's because, it's not because the church is alive, it's because the church is alive and well. And they're well because they study the word of God they study it to live it, and they do live it, and they are engaged in the angelic conflict. And listen to me, we're still winning in America. We are still winning in America because we're still free. When you're not winning, you know because you're not free, and they hunt you down like, like a hungry lion looking for prey. And there are a lot of places in the world today where that goes on. Right, Rick? You've been over there. Listen, I get reports back from our missionaries, especially those guys that are out there in the China and some of those, those nations. I mean, there's good reason why they're called underground. Uh, we, are, we are blessed. And, and listen, sometimes we get maybe get a little discouraged with the church, but listen, and I'll tell you where the church is still strong. It's still strong in the South. But go visit some of the other nations, I mean, uh, the other states. I mean, we're still, we're still strong down here. Uh, we've got a lot of conflicts going on. But listen, the church in the South has won so many good battles. We get no credit for it. We've won some great battles. In the, and I talk, I'm not talking about physical battles. I'm talking about spiritual warfare battles. We've won some great ones. As a church, as church-minded people, grace-oriented, God loves everybody, wants the gospel shared with everybody, wants everybody saved to learn the word of God without, without distinction and without this, without that. I mean, we've... Let me give you an example. Uh, step away for a moment. My sister, my only 
living, I only have two living relatives left. Uh, I got an aunt and I got a sister. My sister, her and her husband just retired. They've done very well in their life. And the year before he retired, they discovered he had Alzheimer's and, it, and it's full blown. And he's been in retirement two years. They invested their money so they could retire early and live the good life, travel and do the things they wanted to do. And he's in, I mean, and it, I mean, it just hit and he's in full blown. Uh, and her, her fear over the safety of him has caused her and the family decide to put it in a nursing home and they found one that was really state of the art kind of thing and only has something like 30, 32 or something residents and they take care of them really well. And of course, it's a chunk of money if you know anything about retirement homes. This is a chunk of money. And it's a chunk of money and my, my sister is eat up with guilt of having of course, he doesn't understand it, right? I mean, one day he's clear, and the next day he is, and the next day. But she's eat up with guilt, and so I spent a great deal of time coaching her up, trying to, and, and, and then the financial thing, and watching all that money go that way when they had all these plans and everything, and him, and him not be able to do it, it's just broken her heart to no, to no end. And... I'm not sure John is saved. I've talked to him many times. I'm not confident of it, like I am with a lot of people. And I encouraged my sister. John, they were, John's family were Dutch reform uh, in the north. And I, and John grew up in the church, but uh <laughs> I don't know. I, I hate to say it, I don't know, and I talk to this man a lot, and I talk to him straight up about it, and I still don't know. But I said, see, and he still has a living sister. I said, call the sister and see if the pastor of the home church that buried their whole family in the church cemetery and all that, see if you can get the pastor to go over and visit with John and develop a thing and be sure that John is saved. She said, that's a good idea. I'll do that. Do that. Um, I said, you're going to have to have somebody. When Do John dies, you need to have somebody to be able to come and officiate and do that. So let's, let's work. Let, let's find a pastor that knows the family, knows the background. That, that made sense to me. And I said, once you get connected with him and everything, I'll call and talk to him and as pastor to a pastor about how important this is and thank him for doing it. Now I'll, I'll do the courtesy call. She said, good, that's good. And so they did. The sister said, oh, that's such a good idea. I know that'd be good. And so he called the pastor and the pastor went, nope. No, I'm not going to do it. I don't do that. I just don't do that. Um, so she, my sister called me. She's all upset. And I said, okay, well, listen, there's got to be, I mean, okay, they don't want to do it. That, that, that's okay. There's got to be somebody who will go do that for you. I said, let's, let's think about it. So I called a couple friends. That's my hometown. So I called a couple friends, and they said, oh, my pastor will do it. And I said, well, great, that would be wonderful. Well, they went, they called me back and said, I'm so upset my pastor wouldn't do it. And I said, well, okay. Um We've gone through a complete list of people. So I call, she, she called me the other day and said, well, we're, I, we've now gone through like six pastors. I said, well, let's quit going. <laughs> let's quit going to pastors then. Let's go to Gideons. God bless the Gideons. God bless the Gideons. I was thinking, what can we do? What can we do? And I thought, Jane's dad was a Gideon, and oh, if you'd, have, if you'd have passed a sheet of paper and said to him, would you make a hospital call, that old man would have left any time, <laughs> he would have left a business deal to go. I, I said, so I called my sister back, 
And she said, well, how can I find him? And I said, well, I'll find him. So I called the guy who comes here all the time. And I said, look, you got a Gideon in Michigan, at Muskegon, Michigan? He said, I'm sure we got him. We got him everywhere, Ron. I said, well, I need a name. And man, it was no time. I had a name. And listen, they are the most wonderful group of people you could ever hope find in the whole wide world. I mean, that was a joy, that man. That was a joy for us to even ask him to do that. It was such a privilege, that man, to do that. And, I mean, he's like a fixture in there now. And once he got his foot in the door like a good Gideon, he makes a, he, he's got all the rooms. He's a Chuck Farmer. And uh, isn't God good? You know, you never give up. And, and I, I'm not disparaging on, on those guys. I mean, they got their own reasons, I suppose, to do that. It's a good reason to be, you know, I will go to the hospital if, if, you, if you ever ask me to go or go to a home. I will definitely do that. You do know that. I don't go out there on my own as a rule because I don't visit homes on my own without an invitation. I just don't want to knock on a door and hear everybody, oh, the pastor's here. Go get, go get your clothes on or something, you know. Uh, <laughs> Pick up some of that stuff. The pastor said, I've heard those at the door. And so, you know, I would always make a call before I visit you. And, uh, and unfortunately, because of that, when I do visit a hospital, everybody gets really nervous. They really get nervous when I show up. They go like, oh, why are you here? And then they look to their people and they go like, did you, is there something going on you haven't told me? So it, there's, it's a two-edged sword. Let me close with this. Listen, he says in verse, I'm on point four, fallen angels are divided into two categories. You know, I said there, there are two that are fallen, but listen, I want to show you two that are really important. There are two categories of the, notice I said fallen angels. There's two categories of fallen angels. Remember I said there are two categories of angels, fallen and, and holy, right, or elect chosen. There is also two of the fallen. All right. So I want to make sure you sure. One is people don't realize are imprisoned. There are angels imprisoned even today. Right? And we've talked about that. Second Peter 2, 4, Jude 6, 1 Peter 3, 19, 20, where Jesus went and spoke to him on the three days of his resurrection, of the three days of his burial. That's interesting. And then you know, I said there was a, a, a leader that, uh, that Satan uh, signed uh, to the fall of the antediluvian period, the, what's called Noah's Flood. Apollo, well, that's Revelation 9. I put that on your paper. That's what, that Revelation 9. That all comes out of uh, that Genesis. And, uh, uh, in 2 Peter 2, 4, it says, God did not spare angels when they sinned. Isn't that interesting? See, where does that idea come from? Well, that came from eternity past, and it's also, the, he's talking about the antediluvian period. And he put him in the, the, the prison has a name. The prison is in Sheo. Remember, Sheo has three parts, right? It, it has a place where, the, uh, where in the Old Testament they went called Paradise or Abraham's bosom. And then there was a place where the unbelievers went called Torment, and there was a place where the prison of angels went like in Genesis 6 called Tatarsus. Tatarus. Tatarus. It's a T A I T A R U S. Tatarus. Um, and that's the name of the prison there. Um, in 2 Peter 2 4, uh, it, uh, it gives a name and I put it on your paper. Okay? Uh, and that is a place committed to the pit of darkness reserved for judgment. And what is that judgment? That's the lake fire. Okay. Um, Satan will be cast into this place, uh, also called the abyss, the angelic prison at the, at the end of the tribulation for a thousand years of the millennium. Remember that? In Revelation 20, verses 1 through 17. It is there we find a whole, uh, a whole menu of names. He was called Dragon. That's his eternal past other name as uh, leading the revolt. He's called the serpent of old in Revelation 2, 2, 20, verse 2. He's called the serpent of old. That was the garden deal 
with the fall of, of uh, dragon is the fall of, of the angels, serpent of old is the fall of uh, Adam and Eve in the garden. And then, uh, and then you have, um, he's called the devil and Satan and he's bound. Uh, and then he will be released at the end of the millennium. And then we have this great wall, war called Gog and Magog, if you're familiar with that. The other group, uh, the other category of fallen angels in our dispensation are called demons. This is the result of the, of the Noahic flood. As a result of Noah's flood, they become the, the, the fallen angels became dis, what, what we call in theology disembodied spirits or demons. Uh, a good example of this is Mark 5. That's that famous demoniac, you know, in the, in the graveyard and all that. And there they're referred to as unclean spirits. The demons are called unclean spirits in that. And uh, that's where um, a conversation between um, the demons and Jesus, and they said, what business, they said to Jesus, the demons said to Jesus in that Mark 5, what business do we have with each other, Jesus, son of the most high God, question. Then they said, I implore you by God, do not torment us. Jesus said, what's your name? He said, legions. That's how many demons were in that man. And, and what did he do? He cast them out. They asked permission. He put them in pigs, and the pigs went in the water. That's a bad day for, well, you know, that's a good day, I guess. In, in, uh, in Luke, the fourth chapter, 31 through 37, that's really interesting. It's on a Sabbath. And he, he's casting out demons again. And the demons say to him, let us alone. What business are, are we, what business do we have with each other, Jesus of Nazareth? Question. Have you come to destroy us? Question. I know who you are. You are the Holy One of God. Isn't it interesting that demons know all that and we don't? Well, they got a long history. These are the fallen angels. And then there are other passages I left with you, okay? Other passages for you to look at. All right, angelic conflict. Now we're about to move out of history and get into our own. So when we come back, we'll start looking at how this stuff works for us in the human, human history. All right. Well, let's close in a word of prayer. Thank you for coming, guys. I know we had another rain. Didn't we? I mean, another. I never did get any rain today, but, boy, I got thunder and lightning. I mean, that. Not as bad as yesterday. No. Not at least where I was. I guess it's. Did you get any out your way? You got a little bit out your way? I know. Billy was getting it out there in Chelsea. All right, well, let's pray. Father, we're so thankful for these that have, quote, weathered the storm in the spiritual sense as well as in the physical sense. Come out to Bible study and those who dropped in with us tonight by Internet. Listen, those of you with the Internet, stay with us. Pick out a night. Maybe pick out three. Tuesday, Wednesday, and Sunday, we're live streaming. But you can find us on doctrinalstudies.com. You can find the answers to all your problems, or most of them, doctrinally. Well, we thank you for coming and staying with us. Stay with us on Wednesday through this course. We'll, we'll, we'll move out of eternity past into the present, and we'll... Talk about how you to be victorious. You may have not even realized you have an angelic conflict. May not even realize there's a spiritual war going on. Maybe you've just heard about it, never thought about it. We will teach you all about it. 
we will teach you how to be a victor, an overcomer in the angelic conflict, how to be a victor. It's a big deal. You, you, you fight this war in the presence of God, uh, of the Lord Jesus Christ, see at the right hand of God and uh, among the holy angels. This is a big deal. And so we thank you, Father, for it. We thank you for this night of study in Jesus' name. Amen.